For years, at-home cooks have been trying to make the perfect roast. On this episode of Cooking School, all the tricks to successful roasting are revealed. I'll teach you the technique for roasting the perfect chicken. And the ideal accompaniment to any meal, perfectly roasted vegetables. Plus, how to prepare a spectacular dish fit for any holiday table, a green peppercorn crusted tenderloin of beef. Roasted chicken. One of the most delectable, delectable dishes that you can serve your friends and family. You have to start with a really good chicken. This is a very nice three and a half pound chicken. And then one lemon sliced, a couple sprigs of rosemary, a couple of cloves of garlic, a little bit of room temperature butter, salt and pepper, a trussing string, and importantly, a meat thermometer. A little white wine for deglazing, and that's really all it takes to have the perfect roast chicken. Let's get to the recipe. Start with the perfect chicken. This is a beautiful organically grown chicken. The giblets are inside. Reserve those. And don't forget to wash the bird. Very important to start with a clean bird. Cold water inside, neck cavity, and shake it dry and dry it with paper toweling. Dry it really well, especially on the outside because that will help the skin crisp up and you want a crispy outer skin and a succulent juicy inside. And now we want to season with salt and pepper inside and uh, just make note that I am not using my fingers in the salt and pepper. I'm using these little scoops which really help keep the salt and pepper bowls clean. Also, one lemon sliced into a quarter inch rounds. Just put those in the cavity. But these things that I'm adding, three or four sprigs of fresh rosemary, this really helps impart a great deal of flavor to the meat of the bird. And three cloves of peeled garlic. So now you're ready to truss. And I like to use a little board that gets washed in the dishwasher. And remember to wash your hands well after doing all of this. Now truss the bird. Then we will spread the whole skin with softened butter. Tuck the wing tips under. That helps keep the bird roasting evenly. And those little wing tips will burn if you don't tuck them under like that. Tuck the neck skin under and then right over the neck bone like that, place your string, and then you come up over the drumsticks like that. Trussing a bird like this allows the meat to roast at the same time. Now spread the butter. Oh, about two tablespoons. Room temperature butter. Do this with your fingers. Just smear it on the dry skin. Now the butter all over the skin like this adds flavor, but it also aids in the browning process of the skin. You want a crispy brown skin while you're maintaining a very nice, soft, and succulent interior. Now a little bit more salt all over the outside. and really flavors the skin and pepper. Now place this bird right on a rack in a heavy bottomed roasting pan. This is a perfect pan for a chicken this size. It will roast very nicely in a 450 degree oven. Now, because the back of the oven is hotter than the front generally, I would suggest putting the drumsticks toward the rear of the oven and the breast toward the front. And when done, the thermometer should read 165 degrees when inserted into the thickest part of the thigh, approximately 50 minutes. So here's the roasted bird. Untruss it. Remember it uh, is 165 degrees in the thickest part of the thigh. And you can take the strings off and remove the bird itself to a platter. It's a little hot. I'll lift it up. Mm -hmm. A prettier view, don't you think? And now take out the rack. Uh, there's not too much in the way of drippings, which is probably a good sign, but if there's a little bit of fat, 
spoon, spoon out the fat. What you want are just those little brown bits here. And just spoon just the fat. And then you deglaze the pan with about a half a cup of white wine. Turn the heat on high, and a half a cup. Bring that to a boil, and use one of these flat wooden spoons. This is the greatest spoon because it really allows you to scrape what's left in the pan. Uh, once this starts to boil and dissolve those brown bits, those caramelized juices, uh, it will come up very nicely. So the white wine is almost reduced. And now just add one or two tablespoons of butter to enrich the sauce. Let that melt into the chicken juices and the white wine. See a little tiny, tiny bit left in, this, in the strainer? Just things that you wouldn't necessarily want to eat. Now give the sauce a taste. Needs a little bit of salt. Not much. Perfect. That little tiny bit of salt added just enough flavor. Here we have the sauce. You can put that in a little gravy boat or in a bowl. You have your roasted chicken. It's ready to take to the table and carve up for your family. Roast chicken. Not only do meats and fish benefit from roasting, but so do vegetables. It's one of the very best ways to impart intense flavor because it brings out the natural sweetness of the vegetables. I'll show you how. Beets roast beautifully, but they have to roast in an enclosed environment. So trim the beets after washing them very, very well. Save the beet greens. These are delicious, steamed or sauteed. And place the beets on a piece of parchment, inside a piece of foil, a little tiny bit of olive oil. Salt and pepper, just a little bit. And then completely enclose in a packet like this and into a 450 degree oven for approximately 30 to 45 minutes. And now our other vegetables. So peel the parsnips with a vegetable peeler. I like parsnips a lot. They have a very nice nutty flavor. Cut this in half and then lengthwise. And the wider part cut into quarters. Carrots, simply prepare, just lightly peel them, especially when they're this skinny a carrot. You don't want to take off too much of the flesh and cut lengthwise. All of these carrots can go in like that. The rest of the parsnips, shallots peeled and cut in half, uh, some rosemary, just the leaves. And it's great if you have at least a small garden or a, a sunny room to grow some rosemary for yourself at home. And Oh, a couple tablespoons of olive oil. And uh, it really adds more flavor and promotes browning. And don't forget, some black pepper, freshly ground, and some coarse salt. Kosher salt is very good for this. And all you use to roast is a cookie sheet. You can do it on parchment if you're lazy and don't want to scrub a cookie sheet. But I find that uh, actually vegetables brown a little bit better on the metal. And don't overcrowd the pan. Put these on and spread these in a layer and get those into the oven, same temperature oven as the beets. Now the roasting time is determined by the type of vegetable, the size, the thickness of the vegetable, the diameter of the cut, 
and of course the density of the vegetable. So these all have about the same density. These are gonna take about 30 minutes. But uh, as you learn how to roast vegetables, you will learn before you take them out of the oven, pierce them with a fork or take one out and taste it to see if it is done. Roasting Brussels sprouts. Clean the Brussels sprouts, cut off the stem end, uh, take off any bruised leaves and cut the Brussels in half like that. And then blanch in boiling water for, oh, two or three minutes. This gets the Brussels sprouts cooking. And we're gonna roast these with olive oil, garlic, and a little bit of rosemary. And I don't uh, put these in ice water if I'm gonna roast them right away. I just put them in a towel just to drain off any excess moisture and then mix them with the rosemary leaves. Just pull some leaves off the stem. Can you see what happens to the Brussels sprouts? They get brighter green as they blanch. They look really pretty. Some garlic cloves, unpeeled, just fine. Took a, just break up a head of garlic like this. It's nice to roast the garlics in their skins because then people can pick them up and squeeze out the flesh onto a piece of toast or bread. They're really good roasted. And for one pound of Brussels sprouts, oh, a head of garlic. Generous, but tasty. And so now take these out of the boiling water and just put them into a towel. Mm, they smell good already. There. Now some salt, black pepper, olive oil. Give them a toss and spread them with the garlic and rosemary on the cookie sheet. Now I would suggest if you are an active cook at home that you have some cookie sheets for baking, for uh, jelly rolls and uh, cakes, sheet cakes. That's, those are your baking sheets and some for roasting. You just don't want to ever pick up the taste of garlic in your next jelly roll. Isn't that a beautiful sight? And turn the cut side down to start. That cut side will get a beautiful brown color. Uh, and put this in a 450 degree oven for approximately 20 minutes. Now can you see there is a baking sheet right here in the oven? Well that is preheating, it's for the potatoes. Uh, the potatoes will uh, cook beautifully, brown beautifully on a preheated pan. Just a little secret, a little hint. So here we have some nice new red potatoes, washed, ready to cook. Cut them in half. And we're gonna use thyme to flavor these. You can use marjoram, you can use oregano, and any flavor that will complement the rest of your meal. And don't use the same herb in everything. It's very nice to alter the seasonings, the herbs, the spices that you use in a meal. Now toss this with that ubiquitous olive oil and more black pepper, coarsely ground, beautiful salt, and some thyme. I'm just going to chop some thyme because it takes a while to pick off all the leaves. I don't mind a few stems. Toss this. And this, again, is ready for that very hot baking sheet. Hear the sizzle? Turn the potatoes over, cut side down. Oops. And get this right back into a 450 degree oven. Okay. These are room temperature now. I took them out of the oven a little while ago, and these, with the beets, will go into our arugula salad. So let me show you how to peel the beets so we don't get ahead of ourselves. Our beets, the skins, sometimes slide right off. Yes, these are sliding right off, but really and truly, wear rubber gloves. Otherwise, your fingers are going to be bright pink. Cut in half like that. Perfectly, perfectly cooked beet. So easy to do this way. It 
So there's our beets. Here's our beautiful green arugula. Put a little bit of dressing on it, not too much. Toss to coat. Use the same bowl that the arugula was in to toss the roasted parsnips and carrots and shallots. Toss this with just a little bit more of the vinaigrette. This is olive oil and a good mild vinegar. Toss. Put these on top of the arugula. Mm, so gorgeous. And now if that were enough, add your lovely beets. Again, toss with just a tiny bit of the vinaigrette. Glistening. And this way, they don't have a chance to bleed over the rest of the vegetables. So roasted vegetables, several different ways, but that's really pretty. Potatoes are delicious. Brussels sprouts are great. The roasting vegetables, a great way to intensify the flavor of those farm fresh picked vegetables. People seem to love beef tenderloin, but it's expensive. So you want to make sure that you roast it correctly. And I'm going to show you how to take this piece of meat, which is an elongated muscle that separates the short loin from the rest of the loin, and how to trim it, tie it, and roast it, most importantly. The first thing we have to do is make sure that it is trimmed correctly. The butcher can do this for you, but a trimmed tenderloin, I find, costs a lot more than an untrimmed. It's easy. You unwrap it and cut out these big pieces of fat. Try not to remove any of the meat. Just, just carefully, carefully take off the fat and any of this sinew that you'll find. And then the ingredients, well, it is a tenderloin, and it weighs about four to five pounds when trimmed and tied. Green peppercorns, which add a very interesting flavor to the meat, salt, olive oil. That's it. The equipment you need is a pan large enough in which to brown it and a tray with a rack uh, large enough to roast it and the oven, 475 degrees. I'm going to show you how to roast this piece right now. So now the fat has been removed from our beautiful tenderloin of beef. Uh, we want to remove this long chain. This can be cooked up as little minute steaks. It can be ground for just a wonderful hamburger. But this is attached way up to about here on the tenderloin. Just trim it off. What we're trying to do is make as even a tenderloin as possible. Now this little tail can be tied right here. Once tied, it's all going to look pretty much uniform. And tying is a little bit of a process. Take your string, this is cotton twine, butcher's string, and tie a knot right here. Be firm. And then you take it over your hand like this and over the meat and separate it, oh, about every inch or so. You see what I'm doing is fun to do this. Pull it tautly, see, and then do that again. Butchers do this so quickly. One, two, three, and the whole thing is tied up. I learned a lot of it from my great uncle, Vichy Joe, in Jersey City, New Jersey, where Vichy Joe had a prime butcher shop. And uh, so this is how you do it. Isn't, isn't that nice and neat? And then take your th string and go underneath each one of these. And remember to bring the meat to room temperature before you start to cook it. Uh, that way you're assured that the inside will cook at the same time as the outside. So here we have the meat, and now what to put on the meat. The green peppercorns, about one tablespoon, just kind of crush in a mortar and pestle. They come packed in brine, so they're a little moist, but easily crushed. They have a nice fruity flavor and pungent flavor, which is nice on the filet. 
And now rub with olive oil all over. This is very important because we're going to brown this on a griddle pan. And so, and it won't stick if you have the olive oil on it. And now the salt, sprinkle the meat with, oh, at least a tablespoon of salt all over. This really does help flavor the meat and prepares it for roasting. And then the green peppercorns. Again, rub those in. They're not gonna stick as easily, but you'll have these rubbing the wonderful crushed flavor into the meat itself. Now put this on the heated griddle pan. It's gonna splutter and splatter. And being dry uh, will really help sear the meat instead of steaming the meat. Mm, looks good. And let it just stay there. Don't be impatient. It's gonna take about three minutes per side to brown it correctly. And uh, this is a very clever way to do it on the griddle pan because most people do not have a pan in which this will fit, including me. Oh, you will see how nicely this meat is getting a gorgeous color. Now the meat tells you when it's ready to be turned. If you try to turn it and it's still sticking, do not try to turn it. It is, it comes right off the griddle when it is ready. That brown, beautiful, almost caramelized surface on the meat. Oh, lovely. And this is the pan that I have prepared for it to go into the oven. This is an oven rack and this is just a cookie sheet. It's perfect for this because the air circulation under the rack will allow the meat to cook more evenly. And roast the meat in a conventional oven at 475 degrees, preheated of course. And if you have a convection oven, which is the best way to cook a piece of meat like this, reduce the temperature to 450 degrees. I think it's ready to turn. Uh, I'm trying to brown the meat really nicely on all sides. We've browned the meat enough. Turn off the griddle pan and remove the meat immediately to the rack. Mm, looks good. Right into the oven. It's gonna take anywhere from 15 minutes to maybe 20, 25 minutes to cook the meat to a temperature, internal temperature of 125 degrees. Uh, you don't want to overcook it and uh, it will continue to cook once it's removed from the oven. I have a couple green peppercorns I'm just gonna put on top and into the oven. Now, this is what a finished filet looks like. It's been resting here on the board for 10 minutes. Remove all the string, and I find it just snipping each string really is the easiest way to get rid of it. It smells good, it looks good and I'm sure it tastes good. So here, just remove every last vestige of string. You don't want to be feeding anybody any string. Oh, and I don't know if I told you, when you buy the meat, make sure that the meat is soft. Uh, if it's too hard to the touch, it might mean that it is full of fat on the inside and you don't want that. And now for slicing, with a very sharp knife, slice into beautiful pieces, about a quarter of an inch thick. Now that is a beautiful filet. And it will look wonderful on a platter like this. Mm, that looks good. And I would say that's perfectly cooked. There you have a really nicely roasted, beautiful cut of meat the beef tenderloin. So I hope you can see how roasting can really show off the flavors of whatever you are cooking, meat, vegetables. So remember, the quality of your ingredients is critically important. Thanks for joining me on this episode of Martha's Cooking School. See you next time.